Now, concerning your healing and your complete restoration in every area of your life, here are some things that I want you to remember, okay? Just let this get down into your spirit today. Tomorrow is a better day. You hear that? Tomorrow is a better day. The Bible says, in fact, it's in also in this chapter, uh, chapter 30 of Psalms, in the fifth verse. It says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy, God's joy comes in the morning. What are you trying to say, Richard? I'm trying to say, however bad things may look today, you can take comfort in the fact and you can believe and release your faith that tomorrow, tomorrow will be a better day. Let me take you back into the Bible. Samaria, the city, was, uh, was shut up by an enemy army who had besieged them. And uh, it was so bad they had no food. They had no way of supporting themselves. Uh, uh, things were, had become extremely expensive. And it was so bad that the, the famine was so bad in that little city that uh, they were actually boiling the flesh of their own children and eating them. Elisha, the prophet, was there. And he came up before the people and said, by this time tomorrow, what cost you a, a dollar or a hundred dollars today will cost you a penny. And uh, one of the guards who stood by the gate said, it'll never happen. And Elisha, quick as a flash, turned to him and said, oh yes, it'll happen tomorrow, but you won't get to eat any of it. And by the way, he didn't get to eat any of it. And that was when those four lepers marched out against the, the enemy army and won a great victory, four men defeating an entire army of thousands and thousands. And the city was saved and, the, and the, the, the shutting of the city was stopped. The city was opened up. Food became uh, plentiful again. And what cost uh, $100 the day before only cost a penny the next day. And sure enough, in the excitement of the people as they ran out to get the food that the army left behind, that man who had doubted Elisha's word about tomorrow was trampled to death. Things may not be working out today. But believe God that they will work out tomorrow. What did that little girl, uh, Annie, uh, sing in that Broadway musical? You remember that? The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there will be sun. Remember that? Just trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not, do not lean unto your own understanding. And before you know it, things are going to begin to shift in your favor. Tomorrow will be a better day. Now, the second thing is hope. Thank God for hope. Hope is the raw material for faith. Faith can move mountains. Jesus taught us that in Mark 11. He said, whoever shall say unto this mountain, this need, this problem, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have what things soever he desires. And when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall receive. That's the word of Jesus. Hope is the raw material of faith. That's why the devil will do anything he can, everything he possibly can in his power to make you feel hopeless because he understands full well that hope deferred will make the heart sick. That's what Proverbs 13 verse 12 says. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So, what do I do, you say? Don't allow the devil to kill your hope. As long as you're alive, as long as you're breathing, as long as you have breath in your body, you can hold on to hope. But you say, well, I'm holding on. <laughs> I'm holding on to that hope. I'm holding on to my rope <laughs> as, as tight as I can, and I'm about, about to fall off the, the line. Well, no, 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 don't do that. Tie a, tie a knot in the end of that rope and don't let go. Hold on to your faith no matter what. And know that this kind of hope I'm talking about, the kind that Romans 4 talks about, this is the kind of hope that never disappoints. It's hope in God. Now, number three. Now, this may sound a little unusual to you. No friction, no movement. Now, listen to that. No friction, no movement. Engineers understand that. Engineers understand just how much friction causes strain and struggle and, and leads to the wearing out of parts. You know, it's because of friction that car engines work. And that's why we put oil in. 
That's why we put oil to, to smooth it out. And, and a lot of us need an oil change in our own believing, our own thinking. We need, a, we need the fresh oil of the Holy Spirit. Well, just like your car needs it, we need it as well. Well, the engineers also understand that without friction, there is no movement. There has to be friction or there's no movement. And the definition of friction, I looked it up last night. It's the action of one surface or object rubbing against another. Well, that's what happens in our car engines. And that's why we use oil. I, I faced many frictions in my life. Uh, my dad told me, Richard, if you're serving God, especially if you're in the healing ministry, there are going to be things that come against you. Uh, you know, friction happens. That's why it's a lot easier to walk on gravel than it is in mud. <laughs> and when there's an attack against your body, that's friction. When there's an attack against your mind, against your spirit, against your relationship with God, when there's an attack against your finances, when there's debt, when there's an attack against your emotions or any other part of your life, that's when you've got to continue to keep moving because the most conducive environment for movement is when there is friction. Don't be discouraged that there's friction. You know, if you're walking side by side with the devil, you'll never meet him head on. There's friction when you're coming like this and you say, no devil, you can't have me, can't have my family, can't have my business, can't have my, my health, can't have my money. No, David said, though I, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Let me tell you this again. If you're serving the Lord, you're gonna have friction, but you can allow that friction to help you move forward in God. Now, number four, let me quickly get to this. He'll never leave you and he'll never, ever forsake you. What makes storms easier to overcome is not how sturdy the boat is. It's the fact that Jesus is in the boat with you. You see what the disciples didn't understand that night was although Jesus was asleep in the boat, he was in the boat. And there was no way that storm could kill them because Jesus was with them. Remember, Jesus had said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And when he said, let us go over, it meant they could not go under. Now, Peter misunderstood it. He said, Master, don't you care we're about to drown? Oh, no. Jesus got up and calmed the sea to sleep with his word. So the next time you feel like the storms of life are just too much, remember that Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, is in your boat. He's in you. According to Colossians 1.27, the hope of glory. And he has promised never, ever to leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. Now, the fifth and final thing I want to share with you is prayer. Prayer changes things. Just picture Elijah up on Mount Carmel. Remember, he had said it's not going to rain until I say so, three years of drought. And now he's facing a major battle against the prophets of Baal, and he winds up uh, uh, having a contest with them and winning the contest and slaying some 450 prophets of Baal. And uh, all of a sudden he says, I hear the abundance of rain. Well, nobody else hears it, but he hears it because he's hearing from the voice of God. And God sends him up to Mount Carmel. He says to King Ahab, get your chariot, get your chariot, get ready, get ready to ride because there's a rain coming. He goes up on top of Mount Carmel. And the Bible says he puts his head between his knees. Now, when you put your head between your knees, all you can do is look down. And when you put your head between your knees, your ears are covered. That means you're not seeing or hearing what the world says and he began to pray. Prayer is the key that unlocks the throne of God's mercy. He prayed and he sent his aide to, the, to look at the sea. And he said, I, I see nothing. A second time, I see nothing. A third time, I see nothing. A fourth time, I see nothing. Five times, I see nothing. A fifth, sixth time. And on the seventh time, he came back to Elijah and said, as you're praying, Master, I see a cloud rising up out of the sea. It's like the shape of a man's hand. And I'm going to paraphrase here. Elijah said, hot dog, Jesus. <laughs> and he, he said, you better get in your chariot, King Ahab, and head back to Jezreel because there's a rain coming. You don't, want to, you don't want to be stuck in the flood. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God came upon Elijah and he outran the chariot of Ahab back to town. Prayer. That's the missing part in so many people's lives. Prayer is the missing part. You see, God is a healer. And he's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he is the same forever. God is a healer. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever in every area of your life. And I'm setting my faith with you right now for healing. 
in every area of your life. Welcome to health in the name of Jesus.